Hello and welcome to Public Affairs, Public Access on Houston Media Source TV. I'm Linda Cohn with the League of Women Voters. This is our media evening. Our guests are two gentlemen who in 2012 received special honors from the League of Women Voters, the President's Medal for Outstanding Public Service in the field of journalism. They are two of Houston's premier communicators. The citation stated that they are the ones who set the stage for lively and learned conversation in the modern public square. A little later on, we'll talk to the fellow who's looking after this telecast right now. His name is Mark Pirtle with Houston Media Source TV. But first, it's time to chat with Ernie Manus of Channel 8, Houston Public Media. We'll be pleased to take your questions and comments. The phone number is 713-807-1794. That's 713-807-1794. If you like to use Twitter, you can reach us with the hashtag LWVHouston. Ernie Manus, anchor <laughs> and producer at Houston Public Media. That's Channel 8. Yes, then. You are the fellow with three Emmys, five Katies, Houston Press Club's Lone Star Award, multiple Viewer Choice Awards, and the Houston Chronicle called you the ultimate interviewer. Well, they didn't know about you yet, so oh, we'll, we'll see. I could yeah, be in I, trouble. I, I think your title is safe. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you started out as a bright young fellow from Binghamton, New York. Nice family. I've met your mom. Nice family, <laughs> nice city, great university town. You were a promising young scholar. Perfect scores on the SATs in math. Yeah, well, yeah. MA, <laughs> MIT had its eye out for you, right? Yeah. Well, you so you wrapped up. Oh, yeah, you wrapped up. <laughs> high school and you packed up and you headed to Chicago to study communications video <laughs> video production and communications that's a very courageous thing to do well it was it was kind of a silly thing to do because everyone thought I'd go into engineering or mathematics yeah. or something like that yeah. and I actually in college only took one math course it was called math in our culture and it was a class where they taught you how to add subtract multiply and divide and it was basically there for inner city kids to be able to do basic math skills but because I tested out of everything else I just needed to take one for graduation wow. so I just took a, a blow off course well, yes, <laughs> and then I concentrated on communications so the dream was already in your mind, even in, in your high school years. I didn't know what the dream was. I mean, the dream for me when I went to college was I was going to be a music video producer. I was going to direct music videos. What year was this? Was mu music videos new? Was it the upcoming We were in then? the mid-'80s, so uh, you know, MTV had, mm. had, had launched. It was in its prime. There was great You were going to get in on the ground floor? A little later than the ground floor, but close enough. I was in an elevator just a couple floors <laughs> up. And uh, I kept thinking, you know, I want to be a director. I want to direct. But I didn't have the patience. I mean, I know myself well enough to know a year on a single project. Uh, but a music video, three-minute thing, I could do that. So that's what mm -hmm. I went to school, actually, with in mind to do. Did you have a lot of family support? Were people telling you, gee, Ernie, that's really cool? Or were they saying, Ernie, have you lost your mind? I think they thought I lost my mind years earlier. So by that point, <laughs> my mind was well gone. <laughs> I had done, I, I was always some sort of a performer of some sort. And, and uh, well, you know what mothers like to tell performers is, yeah, that's nice. Now go get a real job, become a CPA. So you, you know. No, my mom did the opposite. She got involved in whatever I project <laughs> I wanted to do. In high school, I was Binghamton's foremost magician. And I had Ernie's World of Magic, and we traveled around the, the tri city. You did kid, kids' birthday parties? We and did birthday like parties with the MDA Telethon, we did TV, we did all different sorts of shows. And my mom would get down in the basement with us at my house, and she'd help us build the illusions, and she'd paint things and stuff. So there was always that support. But magic takes a great deal of discipline. Yeah, and that's probably why I'm not in it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like the big illusions. I always wanted to be really great at sleight of hand and do this. And that's mm -hmm. the stuff that takes years of practice and dedication. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know that I would have would have done too well there. What did you do? Did you do card tricks? I did a few card tricks. I did the three card Monty where you had to guess where the black ace was with the two red aces and people would bet on it. Did you have a stage name? 
Er, just Ernie. Just Ernie's Ernie? World of Magic. Ernie's World of Magic. Did you have a costume? <laughs> I had a uh, <laughs> great question. <laughs> I had one of those like 70s velour tuxedos, you know, with the ruffled shirt and the big bow tie because I bought it at a used store so I could get, so it was a few years old, but it was fun. And that was your first public performance? I guess so. I mean, I did some high school, or uh, junior high actually, theater and, st mm -hmm. excuse me, theater and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was, yeah. Mm -hmm. When you went to Chicago, you were behind the camera. Uh, Chicago, very quickly I ended up in radio. I was okay. working with television at NBC, but as far as me as a performer, I ended up doing a lot of radio. Mm -hmm. And uh, a friend and I lucked into doing a radio show, a Sunday afternoon radio show, uh, Outlook News Magazine, and we hosted that for, I think it was three years. Was it hard news, or was it more enterprising pieces with background? It was very much like a, um, a magazine format show. So we had mm -hmm. like a news guy who gave us headlines at the top of the hour. We did featured stories. We had celebrity guests or uh, different kinds of guests from different walks of life. It was current affairs. It was pop culture. It was all mixed together. And Gail and I were kind of like the, uh, the glue that held the whole show together. Mm -hmm. Where'd you go from there? From there, then we did another radio show. Well, we took some time off and decided we were going to break into television. We were going to be the next big thing in television. And that didn't exactly happen. So we went back and we did some more radio. And this was all in Chicago. Still. It was all in Chicago. And uh, meanwhile, I was working at NBC Television, uh, worked in their early evening newscasts, and also then went into election and news polling, working for the network in Chicago, and uh, all at NBC. And then I was also working in radio on, the, on a different side of it, producing a sex talk show on the radio for mm -hmm. a prominent sex therapist of the day, Phyllis Levy. So I, uh, I did a few, uh, a tour of duty there. What happened to the music videos? Music, they, they went away. When, <laughs> I think it became when there was so much equipment I had to take with me everywhere I went, and I found out if I didn't do that, I could just show up and talk. It was so much easier. Your natural gift. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't need the magic. I didn't need any of the video camera crew. I could just go. Ernie plus one. Ernie plus one. Was enough for a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was interesting. What drew you to Houston? You didn't stay in Chicago. Uh, I was there a good chunk of time, and then when I left the radio show, in those days, you had to work out of the market to work back in. You couldn't switch between stations. People frowned upon that. So I had left our station and thought, well, I'll just get another radio job. And I started looking, and I didn't want to leave Chicago and all of that. And somebody said to me, looking at all my material, you should be doing television. And I was like, no, I don't want to do TV. You know, I'm great doing the news polling and the statistics. So that's where the math came back in, working with the news polling ah. for NBC. But I was like, my performing is radio. And they said, no, give it a try, give it a try. So I sent out my tape to about nine stations across the country. And all nine of them were favorable to what they saw. And Houston Public Television at the time, Houston PBS back then, now Houston Public Media, they offered me the best deal in the fact that they offered me a guaranteed two-year contract. It wasn't that they were guaranteeing me great money, but I would keep a job at least for two years. And in television, you can go someplace, move, uproot your life, and in six weeks, you're done. What was your audition tape? My audition tape, we, when we used to do, okay, I went to Loyola University, and after, we're, after going to school there, I ended up working there. And I also worked in the television production unit. So while we were doing our radio show, to help the students get some hands-on experience, mm -hmm. we would tape the interviews we would do for my radio show. So I would have a celebrity into a studio that looked very much like this one with lockdown cameras. And, and actually, I always sat on the side of the table, too. Oh. And uh, I it's would- It's like homecoming you. for you. It is. It's very much like it. Uh, I would interview my guests, and then we would edit that up, but then we would use the audio portion for the radio show. So I had hours of footage of me doing interviews with people. Mm. So the guy I worked with on the radio show put it together as a tape, and that's what we used as my audition tape. I should dig that out and take a look at that. That would be You'd interesting to see today. You'd probably be surprised at how good you are. Even no, then. I probably would be surprised the other way. <laughs> so you visited Houston on your, your interview, your job interview. Was that your first visit to yeah, Houston? Because interview. you've become the quintessential Houstonian. Well, it seems as though a place I knew very little about before I came here has definitely become my home and some place that I feel very comfortable. Mm -hmm. I came down here, they, they've brought me down for an interview. I came down for the interview, and then they told me that you will be hosting the TV show live that night, as, a, as my, my interview was to host the show live. It was weeknight edition back in the day. And then my guest was Edward Albee. So I had a whole bunch thrown at me at once, and Edward Albee was thought to be a difficult interview. So they were all waiting to see how I handled it. And Edward and I got along wonderfully. And mm -hmm. so did it. That evening, they offered me the job. Once we got off the air, I went to the producer's home for dinner 
and she got a phone call from the station manager, and they offered me the job. Said to do it. You, you yeah. still have that interview, a tape of that interview with Edward Albee someplace? I'm sure it's at the station somewhere. I, I, I pro <laughs> All right. I'd love to know what you talked about with, with five too. minutes of preparation. <laughs> yeah, I had to call over to the library and have them yeah. post up because we, back in those days, we didn't have the internet like we have today to pull all this stuff That's up. That's right. No Google. <laughs> Couldn't pull out my cell phone and look them up. But uh, yeah, it was it was an interesting time. Yeah, I used Indeed. to I used to go home every night when we did the weeknight edition aired five nights a week live. And I would video, I would VHS record every episode, and I kept them. And I had boxes of all these episodes. <laughs> and eventually I looked at them one day, and I was like, when will it ever be sad enough that I sit home and watch all of these back? So I got rid of most of them. There's a couple I kept because of the moments they had in them. But the station has it all in archives, so yeah. I can get to it. So be before you could blink an eye, you're doing news programs. You're doing interview programs. You're moderating candidate debates arts programs, mm -hmm. I have to check my notes, a spelling bee, yes. and community theater beside. Well, the community theater is, <laughs> that's something totally different. It's something totally different, but it's part of why Houston has embraced you as a native son. Because you're really, you, you really do have this wonderful, magical input to everything that performs. Mm-hmm. I... I guess the way I would look at it is because I came in doing a show such as Weeknight Edition, which was, and before I had gotten here, uh, Houston PBS had done a, a myriad of different shows. And right before I got here, they had decided to kill all local production except for one show. So that one show that would be done live each night would cover everything. So I came into a show where I had to do music conversations one night, uh -huh. theater another, politics, business, family. All of that was what I had to do every night. And I think that's what made it work for me because I think a lot of people in this position can't switch between uh, themes of what they do. Yeah. If you're the news person, you do hard news. If you're the arts person, you do arts. But this gave me, gave me a chance and the audience could see me do all the different things. So mm -hmm. as my interests changed, I would try something new and I was at a station that supported all of that. So it led to interviews. It led to you know different programs we've done. And sure. I think the audience... There was a period, I just am going to ramble on and on, don't mind me. There was a period when we were doing the after party, which was our arts, kind of like the Tonight mm -hmm. Show style art show, on Wednesday nights and my serious in-depth interviews on interviews on Thursday nights in the same time slot, but just two different days. And the audience followed through. And that told us they'll accept you lighthearted and fun and serious and in-depth. And so realizing that. Kind of like actually, high Ernie and low Ernie? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> Good Ernie and bad Ernie. Well, you good or bad, but just different. But you, you sit at that juncture. Even today, you still sit at that juncture of the performing arts and serious old-style journalism, where you have to bring experience and judgment yeah. to your work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would think that part of it is also because of our relationship with the audience, because we're public television, mm -hmm. that that's a different relationship. And so the people that watch us feel as though they're part of our family. So for 18 years, I've been coming into their homes. So I think, and I don't mean to overstep uh, what, what the audience might think of me, but I feel that there's a different relationship that builds there. So it's like watching a friend, a child, a relative change and grow with them, as opposed to having the person that hosts Entertainment Tonight doing that and the person that hosts your news doing that. And so public television gives you a different relationship. I also come into your home and ask you for your help and support. I ask you for your money. And to do that, there has to be a trust there also. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side of that, I work very hard to make sure that when people give that money, that that money that comes in, that we honor and support that in the work we do. So I think the relationship builds, and that's, that's been something that's helped me out. How has PBS changed since those days? It's different, but I think it's more because the audience is changing. And so they're trying to keep up with what's happening, not just with the audience, but with the whole media. It's all it's a different mm -hmm. landscape. When I came here just 18 years ago, it's vastly different from then to now. And the number of challengers that are out there and the availability of product that's out there and what people want from their public television station. And we're in a really odd period right now, I feel, where our core audience was always seen as older, the matures, and that the matures are still watching and they primarily fund. They're the ones more likely to send money in. 
but our audience is getting bigger and getting younger. And things like Downton Abbey have definitely changed mm -hmm. so much of what we do. And now the question is, well, do we program for that younger audience to give them what they're looking for? Do we program for that older audience because we know they're there supporting us? Where do we find that balance? And at the network level, I think they're having a, a challenging time making sure they realize who we are and who we're going to be in the mm -hmm. next generation of who we are. What about the mission to provide educational content for children? Well, I think that will never change. That has stayed constant. And back a million years ago when I was doing radio, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, was one of the guests. When, now it's funny for me to say Mr. Rogers because from manner of speaking, Mr. Rogers is my butler also. But the <laughs> Mr. Rogers with the sweaters and the sneakers, he was a guest on my show. And he was talking to me about how everything that PBS, the public broadcasting, does in their children's education is well thought out. Simply to the fact that when he would enter Mr. Rogers' little house on Mr. <laughs> Rogers' neighborhood, he came in on the left and walked to the right because he was teaching children the way their eyes go to read. So everything in the show moved that direction. So your eyes would be trained to move like that. And that's what they, they, they thought everything out, you know? What, what vaults something like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood away from all the humdrum television programs for children? Why was that know. so usually successful? We know that Sesame Street was usually successful because it was new, it was fresh, it was quick. It was geared to people with an, young people with an attention span of six, seven seconds, right. you know, brought to you by the letter A. Whoever thought of doing something like that before? But <laughs> Mr. Rogers was so traditional. You can see a direct line from Captain Kangaroo to Mr. Rogers, that kind of steady avuncular presence. I think that a lot was put into, and I don't know how it's changed with the way our culture has changed too, but I think in those days they took a very careful look at how, what children related to, at what different ages different things hold their attention, what doesn't hold their attention, what the lessons are. And on top of all that, I think there was a genuineness of Fred Rogers. There was something he brought to the table that was different. I think 20 other people could have done the exact same show and it would not have connected. I think there was something he did, something mm -hmm. that was him. I think maybe kids really felt he cared for them. And if you ever met him, you would realize that was true. He did. There was a, there was a light around that man. And mm -hmm. I think that there are certain people that that medium really speaks to the way they do things. I mean, to take it out of the public television realm, there's then you can look at Oprah, who was mm -hmm. so different than that, but there was something in the way. A million others have done talk shows in the afternoon, like Oprah did, but somehow she had something different that connected. And it can be the producers, her personality, the timing, the audience, all of it just coming together at that right moment. And I think Mr. Rogers was just one of those people. But I think in general, public television looks at its children's programming differently. We're not there to sell a toy or a cereal. We're there to educate the children. And even when we developed The After Party, our late night talk show, mm -hmm. our whole idea behind that was we wanted to do a show that was, and we thought about it before we put the show on, we wanted to do a show that was enjoyable, easy to watch, anybody could tune in, but in the process of it, they would be educated about the arts. And it wouldn't be... We're here at the museum right now, and this is a statue of Tom, and Tom's was built in Burr. We didn't want that. We wanted an audience that if you, because one of the things I looked at developing that show was the audience felt excluded from the arts, that almost as though there had been a separation that was developing, that the arts were highbrow, high society, and it wasn't accessible to the general public anymore, even though the arts organizations were trying to open that and play into that. So what I wanted to do was a lighthearted, fun, warm show that you could tune in. And what funny thing that happened with it was our audiences in studio tended to mostly be high school and junior high kids. So we were bringing in a much younger audience than we ever imagined we would with a late night talk show, but they could relate to the format. So the format brought them in, but the education was underneath it. And I think that's what you'll notice. We talk about this sometimes on Pledge. No matter what the show is, if it's an entertainment show, if it's a documentary, if it's a news program, that there's another layer underneath it of educating you about something more taking you on an adventure, exposing you to something you may not have seen before or explored or understood. And that's always at the root of everything we do, or should be. And sometimes I think along the way, like anything, they lose sight of it. But I think as an organization, we're very good to quickly figure that out and get back on track. And I think that's why we've been successful as long as we have. Have you been concerned about the bottom line? After all, you do have to pay the electric bills at PBS. 
Is your funding affected by what you put on the air, or do people just kind of like PBS and they're going to give you money? There is definitely a difference in programming to what people pledge for. Uh, you will notice there are certain shows that bring in dollars more than other shows. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have, and PBS, we talk about PBS in generalities, but it's actually, it's a collection of individual stations. So mm -hmm. Houston Public Media is one station, and we are basically autonomous. What we do is PBS is a program provider, so they give us product to put mm -hmm. on our service. But we are our own okay. entity, which people need to understand that because they sometimes think it's like commercial television where the network tells you what to do, and that's not the case. And we have been very fortunate for many, many years where our programming department stays very separate from our underwriting and our funding departments. And so, and now more than ever, we're making it very clean cut that what we do in product and in production we do because there is a need for it or we feel that it's what the audience should be having or it's what we've heard the audience wants or it's so we keep that very separate than where the money's coming in and development team does not talk to producers and they shouldn't because in our model the people that are funding are funding the concept of public television and we are providing product but if those two got intermixed it, it could be very difficult we have a call. Should we take a Oh, call? let's take a call. Let's take that phone call. <laughs> it's probably someone calling and say, enough, Ernie. <laughs> <laughs> Is the caller there? We may have lost the caller. We scared them away. Uh, we we, talk we may in, indeed have done that. Let me ask you about interviews, your interviews program. You're going into our 13th season. Is this your, do you regard this as your signature program? I think so. I mean, it's very funny. Whenever I talk to a group, They'll always introduce me kind of like you did, and I'll run through all my accolades and all of this stuff, and everyone sits there, you know, kind of like, whatever. And then somebody says, oh, and he also talks about Downton Abbey after, and everyone, oh, now we know who you are. So as much as I always thought... You're, you're talking directly to me, I know. Aren't you? You're talking but directly. As much as yeah. I always thought interviews was the thing that people would always remember, and that would be the mark I made was that series, I have a funny feeling manner of speaking is going to be... That's going to be the one people always refer to when they think of me. Uh, Downton Abbey will come and go. Interviews will be on the shelves of libraries forever. Well, thank you. Truly. You, uh, it, it, it is an amazing program. The title alone is the, probably the most magnificent pun ever. <laughs> well, thank you. You have a very gentle approach. Yeah. It is um, almost a sweet-natured approach, but you're dealing, and you, your interviewees sometimes canter toward the entertainment industry. Yeah. But these are people who have led significant lives. Somebody said to me, how do you pick the guests that are on the show? And once again, I am blessed that I work where I work because I have certain freedoms you wouldn't get anywhere else. I get to ma basically pick the guests I have on the show. I book my own show. So I'm not in the situation of somebody tells me, you're going to be interviewing this person on Thursday. And let's so, be this is a nationally syndicated program. Right, yeah. We've aired up to uh, 100 PBS stations across the mm -hmm. country. And uh, I think I go into it as a fan of each of these people. And somebody asked me, how do you pick who's on the show? And my answer has always been, when we put their name up underneath them, we don't have to put anything else. So uh -huh. if it says Joel Gray, you know that name. Mm -hmm. If it says, you know, Kevin Spacey, we don't have to go and then say who Kevin Spacey is. And so that's kind of the majority of how I pick the guests, that they should be someone people know. They have to have a life or a career worth talking about. It's a half an hour. Most people see 90-second interviews on television now. And so it's got to be... It's uncut. It's yes. broadcast uncut and unedited. What you see is basically, there's been a couple little uh, cleanup edits are put in occasionally, mm -hmm. but basically I sit down with the guests for 20, well, 25 minutes and 15 seconds, and you see that on TV. Basically what you don't see is them coming in and getting mic'd, saying hello, because I don't like to see the guests before we start the interview, saying hello, and then we start rolling tape. And then when we're done, it's on the tape. I thank them for coming. And usually we get up, we take a picture, they walk out. And so basically you're with them as long as I am. Is your approach calculated to allow people to open up to you in a certain way? Or are you just such a nice guy that you can't bear to ask the hard questions? I think we ask all the hard questions. I think we just do it in a different way. I think we also... And I say we. I also look at it as what really is the important question to ask. There are some tabloid questions that are out there that are on the audience minds, and I'll ask them those questions. 
But for the most part, if I don't think it's significant to really their career, their body of work, their legacy, then I'm really not going to mess in that. So that might make it look like it's a more gentle approach, but it's more I'm trying to think, is everything that's being said something we can learn from? Are we going somewhere with this? Um, so the, the approach, I think, has been honed over time mm -hmm. to be able to allow the guest to feel comfortable enough to open up and talk to me. Do you, do, you don't do pre-interviews, do you? No, I will not do, do a pre-interview. Um, I, don't, I don't like them. Uh, oftentimes will be requested. Uh, Yoko Ono, many years ago, she had, see, I love to name drop too. <laughs> Yoko Ono had, her office had finally agreed to let me do her. This was back in radio days. And, uh, but they wanted a list of the questions and I had no idea what I was going to ask because I also try and make it a natural conversation. Mm -hmm. So I don't prepare questions ahead of time. I know where I want to go, but that's something different. And so we had come up with 20 questions. We sent them to her office. She agreed to them. She started the interview and she answered the first 18 of them with a yes or no answer. So we had 20 minutes with her and about three minutes in, we were basically out of questions. And I thought, where do we go from here? Mm. And, uh, I just went on a limb and I asked her about being a mother. And I asked her, you know, do you see yourself first and foremost as a mother or mm -hmm. as a, a peace activist or whatever I said? And that turned the switch in her. And she was like, a mother. And she started talking about Sean and raising her son and what that meant to her and not having John there to do it. And it just evolved and it opened up the doors. And so I think if you can show enough interest in the guest, if you really are curious and you engage them in the conversation, they will open up and they will give you so much more than if you hammer them with prepared questions. But I'll jump in and say this real quick. <laughs> Don't mistake that as not being prepared for the interview. You know, I, I, this evening after we're done, I'll be home preparing for an interview I'm going to do tomorrow. And so for me, that means knowing everything about their life to the point that if they bring up something, I know why they're bringing it up. And if they don't, I know to bring it up. You know how to advance yeah. the conversation. Have you ever, with that extensive prep in your, in your background, have you ever been surprised by an answer? Oh, all the time. Because I think for me, being prepared, knowing what they're going to talk about, is having listened to, watched, read so many interviews, but I'm curious in the next step, the next question. So if they talk about their upbringing in the school they went to and how influential it was on them, because it took them into acting and all of that, well, was there a moment in the school that these things changed for them? And that's the stuff they haven't talked about. It's going beyond the question that's there to find the next question. And so, yes, I, I want to be I want to be thrilled. I want to learn something new. I want to take a question that maybe they've answered before and find a deeper, different answer to it. And so, yeah, I'm always surprised. If I wasn't, I would be bored to tears. <laughs> have you ever been unpleasantly surprised by the turn a conversation may have taken, an unexpected turn to the conversation? Ever wonder how to get out of it? Oh, I've often wondered how to get out of it. Uh, <laughs> not often. That's unfair to say. But those usually are the thoughts before they start. There have been a couple interviews where I just don't know what's going on, you know, or I'm trying to understand this now with the number of interviews we've done. And remember, out of interviews alone, we've done over 200 episodes of that show. But then you take all the other shows I've done. There are thousands of interviews I've conducted over the years. And I'm trying to figure out why some work and some don't. And what I currently this is my theory on it is that we make connections with people, certain uh -huh. people. And, you know, if you meet six people at a party. Some of those people you connect with better and some you don't. And when I meet six different people to be guests on interviews, some I'll connect with better and some I won't. And so I think there's something in just human chemistry that sometimes they're going to mm. click better and not. Um, sometimes I just feel like I'll ask you this question and you'll answer this question. And it doesn't matter. And then I try and ask that question and you're back down here. We're just not connecting. And that happens. My job, though, is to figure out as quickly as I can why we're not and fix it. And so that's what I'm always trying to do if it's not working. Do you have a favorite interviewee? You know, it, it shifts all the time, depending on what show we're editing at the time. Um, <laughs> one of my all-time favorites, and I give this answer all the time, is Patti LuPone. She was one of the first people we interviewed, big Broadway star, movies, TV. And we had heard that she was going to be a difficult diva. And she was one of the first interviews, as I said, we did for the series. We hadn't even started this show yet, and we were taping her first. And they asked to see copies of the show in advance, her PR people, and we didn't have any. And I thought, this is never going to work. And she's such a legend and all that. And they finally allowed her. And I'd heard from friends of mine in the theater, oh, you know, be careful, you know, what's coming. <laughs> she showed up at the, at the hotel room where we were set up alone, came in, couldn't have been sweeter, so gentle, sat down, 
told everything I wanted to know in full, wonderful stories, very theatrical. <laughs> it was a fabulous moment. And I always think, wow, that was, and I, I think I learned a lot from that, is that's the way to be. Give them what they want, you know? So she was really wonderful. Who would you like to nab for an interview? Cher. <laughs> and I can answer that so easily. Oh, yeah, that you didn't hesitate very much. No, and it's it's funny, and people think it's because, oh, you're a big Cher fan. It's not necessarily... Are you a big Cher fan? Of course, who is? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's the fact that what she has done with her career fascinates me. I, the thing that I'm amazed with and what I try to bring into all the shows is people who have succeeded, people who know how to use the creative mind and come up with something fresh and new and keep going. And Cher has been... She has had a number one hit on the charts for every decade for 50 years. That's unheard of. And it'll never happen again because our tastes change so quickly now to have that kind of. She had in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, zeros, and now in the 10s. So I guess seven different decades she's had a number one hit. Phenomenal. And she knows how to go away and come back. She knows how to reinvent herself, but to stay true to who she is. She knows how to keep the audience interested. That I want to know more about. I want to know how she does that. Cher is a great lead into my next question. I can't even is, imagine. Oh, yes. Is this a glamorous business? Um, we have access to glamour. Well, you know why I'm asking this question. You're a trooper. You are a trooper. You've moderated debates for the League of Women Voters, and you sat in this very studio moderating municipal candidates for office, a debate, a joint appearance among them, with two broken arms. <laughs> That's my broken hands. That was, and you I couldn't actually shake any of their hands. You, could, you took your casts off so you could hold your yeah. index cards, and I think you were in a considerable amount of pain. At times, but and you did it anyway. On. The show goes on. Yeah. Uh, this is this is not a a, a, a uh, an industry for sissies. Yes and no. I mean, and I have to say, my job is so much easier than so many people's jobs. There are people out there that are working on crews that are physical laborers that really do work very hard and put themselves in harm's way every day. I sit in a studio and talk to people. I mean, I can't really say that I have it tough in any way at all. I have been blessed and fortunate. There are moments within that world that can be more uncomfortable than others, but, uh, you know. But you have a responsibility. Yes. That you take very, very seriously. Yes. I, I believe when people tune to me, and I don't know if this answers exactly what you're saying, but I believe that what everything that comes out of my mouth has to be honest and fair and just. In my personal life, it probably and, isn't always but the same. But that is the tradition but, of journalism. A public journal is a public trust. Mm -hmm. That is the best that you get George Polk Awards for that. <laughs> well, I haven't got one of those. <laughs> one day, and one day you shall. That, that is in the best tradition. Well, I think that there, to of go journalism. back on what I was saying before, too, we are blessed that we have these jobs and they come with a responsibility. And so when you talk about the different stuff I do, I find it very hard to say no if I can physically do something. Because I work, I go off, you, you know this having known me for a while, I think <laughs> just like with politicians, you have to answer to the people who put you where you're at. And politicians that are elected into office and choose not to speak publicly, not to address questions, I have a very difficult time with that. I think that's our duty and our responsibility. If my, off if my boss calls me into her office, I have to go and I have to answer her questions because she pays the bills. She put me where I'm at, just like elected officials. But I also feel that the public, because I'm in public media, have put me where I'm at. And that I have to be accessible to them, too. And I have to help them in anything that I have gained because of my position really belongs to the public. And so if I'm not sharing it back with them, then I'm taking from them and not giving back what's justly theirs. And so I, I truly believe that. You have access to glamour. Does a I little, have lots of access does, to glamour. Does a little bit rub off on you? <laughs> <laughs> Please I, tell me yes, don't I take don't, away all my... <laughs> I don't know that anyone would think of me as glamorous or that I live the glamorous life. I think you I meet glamorous people. I meet glamorous people. I have access to a lot of things most people don't have access to, and I think about it all the time, and I am appreciative for it. I'll never take it for granted. Early on in my career, I said, you know, if it ever came to the point that I wasn't awed by the people I got to work with, 
I shouldn't be in the business. If I ever sit down with some Academy Award winning star or some Nobel Peace Prize winner and I think, oh yeah, the next one, I should pack it up and leave. Do you think that some of your interview subjects are slightly awed by you? I never thought of it. I, I doubt it. But they've agreed to take some time out of their very busy days yeah, I will sit and talk with you because why? Well, I have they know they're going to get a fair shake. <laughs> I hope. I hope they know that. I think that's one thing that's worked in our in our behalf is that people don't feel as I will attack them. I think if any scandal were to break, if I or my office contacted someone and they knew it was me doing the interview or inquiring, they would be more likely to come because I think we've built a career of not attacking, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's also comes from working with the league, too. The league has a very similar, uh, the community has this a is true. similar feeling. This is them. true. And we I, believe in civil discourse. Right, and I think that's so important. It doesn't mean that it's an easy walk. It doesn't mean that it's going to be... Uh, Sometimes it's easier to shout. Right. Yeah, but we're going to give you a fair say. And I've always said that, that if people look at the, the especially on interviews, because it's a single guest for the half hour, mm -hmm. that if people feel it's, it's slanted one way or the other because of a guest we have, watch the full series, watch the shows. You'll see we give everyone a fair chance to speak and that the audience has to be able to think about what's being said and make their own decision. It's not my job to tell you how to think. My job is to bring the information to the table so you can make up your mind. Talk to me a bit about social media. You're on social media. You love social media. You hate social media. You I, could live without it. You can't live without it. I love the idea of it, and I still don't think we have figured out how to harness the real source of it. You know, we're, we're at the mercy of too many other things right now. Um, I think this, this whole Twitter thing, you'll see my Twitter handle keeps popping up. It's great, but it's for a moment, an instant. And if you don't see it when it happens, most people will never see it. It's great when you're searching for particular topics. It's great when you want to communicate. When we do Manner of Speaking, our Downton mm -hmm. Abbey show, it's a big part of the show. People can send in their questions through social media, and we can get them in a moment. And it's easier for us than taking phone calls because we're live and we don't want spoilers. So we've got to be careful about calls. No filters, though. We're, again, where is right. that judgment? Where is that experience? Where is that insistence that we get things not only quickly but get it right? Um, I'm not sure I know what you're asking. Uh, you can't, um, not only you, but everybody on Twitter, mm -hmm. a, a rumor, a flash, nothing passes the smell test right. anymore. There, right. There's no well, editorial today, for example, control. Joan Rivers passed away yes. today. Very sad. Uh, and then I saw the Twitters and the Facebook posts about Betty White having passed away also. Betty White did not pass away today. Betty White is alive and fine. It has gone crazy out there, and people who, believe who, she's dead. Who was was passing along the incorrect information? Was it? Once it got out there, it was unstoppable. It and was this this is yeah, right. This is the crux of the question. And it came from, and I don't know the full story yet, so I'm going to pass along <laughs> unsure information. But it was a, a humorous article about how Betty White dyes her hair at home. So Betty White was dying comfortably at home, was what the headline was. But it was dying as in die job, not dying as in passing away. That, Too clever for its own good. Right. And that's where the story started, as best we can tell at this point. We, like I'm in charge of social media and we're well. investigating. <laughs> but, but that's what you're talking about. It's like, yeah. as soon as that got out there, I saw posts from my friends. So sad. Not only did we lose Joan Rivers, we lost Betty White. And so I posted on my Facebook page, Betty White's not dead, people. This is a false story. Look into it. Realize it. And I think that's part of the problem of social media. It's mm -hmm. great for uh, having a community voice and being heard and sharing ideas and talking to each other. But there has got to be some way of making sure that what's going out there is valid and real. And I think that's part of our responsibility. What I'm talking about when I do a show and I put a guest out there, I may not attack the guest because I don't agree with the guest, but I'll ask them enough questions that they can explain their philosophy for why they're doing something. And then I really do believe the viewer has the responsibility then to look more to see, you know, they believe this because A, B, and C. That's been a recurrent theme in this conversation. There's a collaboration between the viewer mm -hmm. and you. Yeah, well, I try. Hmm. Ernie, the last word goes to you. What do you want Houston to know about Ernie Manus? Oh, I don't like those kind of questions. hate open-ended questions. Very open-ended. Very, and I do it all the time, so it's only <laughs> fair. I think that uh, it's So there's truth to what spills out. Well, the truth is that it's much easier for me to be in that chair than it is to be in this <laughs> chair. Uh, 
I'm much shorter, and I have my thoughts put together much better. I, I just am thrilled to be able to do the work that I do, and I'm thrilled that Houston allows me to do it. And that it's been 18 years, and I hope that there's more of them ahead of us. Thanks, Ernie. Thank Houston you, Public Media Channel 8. We're going to take a short break. We'll post some website information, and we most cordially invite you to visit those websites. Be back in a minute with Mark Pirtle, Houston Media Source TV. Welcome back to Public Affairs, Public Access on Houston Media Source TV. I'm Linda Cohn with the League of Women Voters, and I'm in the control room with Mark Pirtle of Houston Media Source TV. Mark, you are passionate about bringing First Amendment privileges to everyone. Tell us about Houston Media Source and how you do that. Oh, gosh. Uh... It's the difference between shouting something from your street corner and being able to address the entire Houston community. Yeah, gosh, there's, there's so much history to public access. Public access uh, exists in the United States because media activists lobbied uh, the Federal Communications Commission back when cable regulated, uh, was regulated by the FCC. And so it, it came into existence because the public demanded that it exist, asked for it to exist. Uh, the cable business occupies the public utility easement. That's public property. And this is part of, it was created as part of what the cable industry gave back to the people of the United States in exchange for the public utility easement. The cable industry also funds C-SPAN. Uh, they pay franchise fees. And so uh, there's a lot of great public good that's being done by the cable business and uh, public access is part of a group called PEG access, public, educational, and governmental access. And governmental access is where you get to watch uh, the uh, city council operate, various government bodies and boards and commissions. Mm -hmm. 
Educational access in Houston is occupied by the Houston Community College System and the Houston Independent School District. And uh, this organization, uh, Houston Media Source, was created by the city of Houston uh, as a service organization. And uh, uh, we are the referees. We operate the rules. But what you see on this channel is, is, is what the public brings in. So I... It was a rather long-winded answer, but... No, no, no. Tell, tell me who your typical users are. There are people off the street, people with a particular political idea to promote, people with a point of view to express, people who just want to spark public discussion. You have religious programming. It runs the gamut. Yes. Uh, what, what you see on this channel is the result of the people who had the energy and and desire and and who followed through and actually did it most of what you see on the channel is what your neighbors came down here and and uh, and submitted so anybody comes to Houston Media Source signs up learns how to use the equipment and has at it that's true um, there's a right outside this door there's a drop box and people are walking in the door all the time mm -hmm. uh, they uh, fill out a contract, the contract, uh, the contract uh, where they take responsibility for the program and they uh, wrap it up with a rubber band and drop it in the box and then our programming director uh, schedules them on a first come first serve basis based on their request for time. Uh, they get repeated numerous times and so um, people get accumulative writing. Uh, they get a lot of exposure. This channel is seen on uh, Channel 17 on Comcast, it's seen on uh, 75 on Phonoscope, 99.4 on UVerse, and also on Suddenlink and uh, TV Max. And live streamed through we, your we website? Also, we also have a very, very high quality, uh, we also have a very, very high quality uh, internet feed. Um, recently, we, we're, uh, technology's changing. Uh, we are now able to send live video through uh, through the internet. Uh, we uh, we send we can send broadcast video. We can do live remotes and put out them, in the field. Yes. Yeah. Let me ask you what the difference is. It has certain a uh, certain do-it-yourself element to Houston Media Source Television, but yet it's different from what I could do with my tablet or with my telephone video. How is it different? We know it's more polished. Yes, um, there. I, I, take, the I think I take your point. Allow, allows for editing. It allows for a certain degree of quality that's not available from your typical smartphone videos. Yes, the, uh, the when this organization w was created, the technology that was mainly available was three quarter inch video, and we had just transitioned from. Uh, and that's actual tape. Yeah, actual tape from vacuum tube cameras. To, uh, to chip cameras, and then we spent, a, spent eight, or, eight years or so on three-quarter And in those days, people didn't typically walk around with a recording device in their pockets the way they do today. Yeah, then we went to beta, and I'm sorry to make this long-winded. Then we hit, this, <laughs> we hit this digital revolution. We went from the era of, of uh, signal-based media to file-based media. And now uh, you're, you're, everything's a computer now. Everything has an IP address. And uh, instead of editing on tape, you edit in a computer. Uh, Avid, Final Cut, uh, Adobe, various mm -hmm. editing platforms. And, uh, but the, the function of this organization, it's, it's similar to a library, possibly, in that, but it's sort of like a, a working library where people can come in and uh, work with, with technical you know, equipment, video cameras and editing equipment and various filmmaking tools uh, in order to make their own program. And then we teach people the, the new workflows of the new digital media so that you can uh, shoot your material, get it through the editing system, and then out to your deliverable. Your deliverable could be the internet, it could be DVD or Blu-ray or the broadcast channels, cable mm -hmm. channels. And, and then digital cinema intermediates. People here make films that they, they want to mm -hmm. uh, go to film festivals with. They, they want to use your state-of-the-art equipment without having to make a huge financial investment. And, and that you spoke about this organization as being a, a gateway 
for aspiring producers, aspiring film producers? Very much. Um, I, I, uh, there have been there have been some successful people that I know of who've gone on to broadcast careers who have started through this place. Uh, various people who've worked at different TV stations around town. In Austin, uh, Robert Rodriguez made his film Ar El Mariachi at, through the facilities of the Austin Access Channel. So this is a gateway for lots of people uh, to, to get the access to the technical infrastructure and they bring their artistic vision and energy and then they, they make their films and you know comply with the rules and show them on the Access Channel but then move on to other venues. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, I'm, I'm aware of a lot of people who've used this to launch careers. Mm. And uh, we should make it clear also that a political point of view is fine, a partisan point of view is fine. We are content neutral. That's part of the structure of, of public access. And uh, uh, we provide the platform and the infrastructure, but what you see here, the content is design is is created and driven by the people who come here and 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 deliver it and espouse it. The League has participated. The League of Women Voters have, and we've become good friends. It, this is a wonderful way for us to talk about the issues that are important to the public, and it's a wonderful way to have candidate debates. It's a wonderful way to disseminate information about the election process. Uh, things that people need to know. We joke, we say nobody is born knowing how to vote. You have to learn the process, and this is one great way to get the word out. Yes, that's been, I mean, I'm really happy to have worked with you guys uh, because y'all have done, y'all have brought so much content. Y'all do so much heavy lifting. You bring it in, and you bring <laughs> There's it. There's a lot. You got Ernie Manus to come in here, and that was fantastic for public access. Well, and and got us on, I mean, you, you, you got a lot more exposure for the public access channel. It was, you and he are among the premier communicators in the, in the you're Houston very nice area. Here. No, this, 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 this goes without saying. There's no other side to that particular story. Mark, how did you get started with this? Per, you personally, when you went to school, did you study video work? Did you study journalism? Uh, in, when I was in high school, I had a teacher named Helen Foley, and she taught a human, humanities class. And she uh, this was in Houston. Now you are a native son. I'm um, pretty much, and uh, <laughs> she was uh, involved with the, uh, James Blue, who created the Rice Media Center and uh, the Territory, which is uh, actually a show on Houston PBS. Uh, and it was. The Rice Media Center uh, was uh, James Blue's vision of an independent media. See, that's another thing I'm very concerned about is in, in the history of media and, you know, electronic media in the United States, radio stations and television stations, a lot of them across the country were, you know, mom and pops and small companies. And there has been this long trend of consolidation. And now there are about six companies that own most of it. And that's something very important that public access supplies is a venue for anyone with a little lunch money to come down and avail themselves of, you know, cable channels that are seen on the rest of the, on the whole system. And really to get a, a leg up and a, an even, you know, try to even the playing field so that the that, uh, free speech you know that old saying about you mm -hmm. have free speech if you happen to own a printing press. Well, this is for that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I hope I answered your what, question. Go back to Miss Foley in in, oh, uh, in yeah. high school. Yeah, I, I I digress. Well, she uh, she uh, she hooked up with James Blue, and they brought over these uh, three these black and white porta packs, and I thought they were interesting and. Uh, but I actually started making films on Super 8. And I was just in love with film because it was so much fun. I, I had so much fun editing. And the idea that when you put one shot next to another, it acquires a different meaning. And that goes back to this Russian guy, or Sergei Eisenstein. He sort of invented that. And I found that just thrilling when you would put pieces together and suddenly this meaning would did, emerge. Did Super 8 film have an audio component? Not when I was using it. Tell me it. about it, it. 
Well, actually, what I would do but is... That was the kind of film you used to splice together when cut and splice actually meant you cut. Yeah. And you got glue. Yeah, we, we, we used tape, a guillotine well, tape I'm splicer. I'm dating myself now. <laughs> but but uh, you, the, the soundtrack was a cassette, but it was really thrilling, and um, that got me interested in it. And Helen Foley got me interested in the NFLCP, which is a precursor to the organizations that... Uh, uh, became the Alliance for Community Media, which is an umbrella organizations that prom promulgated and mm -hmm. promoted and helped local. See, every access center is a creation of the local community. Mm -hmm. They avail themselves of the power that's built into the law and they make their own access channel. And uh, I'm sorry, I probably already lost the question, but uh, I was very excited by that. Mostly the technology of it, the art of putting together a film, or was it the content that got you? Was it a way to, to promote a certain idea, a way to explore a certain issue? Hmm. Yeah, all, of, all of that at the same time, I, I, it's, it's a lot of fun. The art of it is fun. Um, uh, because I got to tell you, very often when we're pulling together one of our telecasts, we start out from point A, and as it advances, as we walk through a perspective outline, uh, things change. Emphasis shifts. Mm -hmm. It's a collaborative art. Uh, it takes a lot of different people. People are working in different domains. Uh, working with you guys, uh, y'all produce the content. Um, you know, I do this technical stuff. It's basically a rapper, and you know, once I fade up to you, I'm just following you. Um, I'm, I'm rambling. And you want to invite other people to do the same? Absolutely, it's thrilling because I, it, it, it is so much fun when you see people from Houston come in and get excited and grab control of their own, enable themselves. They they take little classes. They take out equipment and. They have so much, they feel so thrilled when they can make their own program and it's on television and they get their neighbors and friends to see it. And uh, Yeah, it's kind of cool, huh? It is. We've got about one kinda minute. Kind of cool. Linda. we got to wrap. I see. Well, I'm, I'm going to encourage anyone with a particular interest in the visual media to go ahead and give you a call. That would be super. Uh, HMSTV.org, you can find out all about us, and I'm going to have to play some music and put up a slide. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Our telecast draws to a close. Thank you.